their Brower Cathedral. And they said that only, if only other countries all around the world did what President Mubarak had done, then the world would be a far better place because there would be more growth, more prosperity, more equality and more harmony. Well, the outcome of those policies was a greater increase in inequality, more immiseration, in other words, more grinding poverty, the privatisation of huge swathes of the state sector, the driving off the land of millions of Egyptian peasants, the Falahim, the cultivators, as land was taken away from people who 50 years ago got small plots themselves, agriculture was commercialised, and instead of growing rice, or potatoes, or onions, or fodder for the animals, the things that peasant societies all over the world need in order to live, the land was put over to growing strawberries to go into supermarkets in London, and green beans luxury green beans to go to supermarkets in Paris and Berlin. Millions of people were compelled to leave the countryside and to migrate. Many of them went to the big cities of Egypt, especially of course to Cairo. And as years passed, millions and millions of Egyptians found themselves living at the very margin of society. Now a very interesting thing about neoliberalism, which our government in Britain loves to talk about, is the idea that if you push back the state, if you push back the welfare state, the private business will rush in and create job opportunities and disseminate prosperity through more employment and the creation of more wealth. Egypt is proof positive that exactly the opposite happens. And what happened indeed in Egypt was that tens of millions of people found themselves living at the very margin. In January of this year, Maybe you, like me, were glued to Al Jazeera watching the events in Cairo, which were breathtaking. And they were world historic events. And I'd even go so far as to suggest the reason we're here and the reason that people are occupying across a hundred American cities is connected to what happened in January and February in Tunis and in Cairo. Because in those countries, people finally said that they had had enough, not only because they weren't sure if they could feed their children, not just because they weren't sure if there was a job for them the next day or they'd been driven off the land, but also because the state which was supposed to go away was a state which had been mercilessly driving them down. Because if you watched Al Jazeera, you would have seen in those amazing documentary video films, you would have seen the riot police, the military police, and what the Egyptians called the Baltigaya, the thugs, attacking the demonstrators of Tahrir Square. So, it wasn't that the state was going away, the state was intruding into the life, in many ways, of every Egyptian family. Because for the last 20 years, the Egyptian police have deservedly gained a reputation as amongst the most brutal security forces on the face of the planet. And this is a police force and a military in Egypt, which enjoys intimate relations with the governments of the West, especially with the American government and indeed with the British government. Do you remember extraordinary rendition which took hundreds of people picked up mainly in Pakistan by the American forces 
and they took them to places where they would be tortured into confessions before being sent to Guantanamo Bay. Well, Cairo was the favourite place to send captured prisoners for rendition because it was said that it was there, it was safe to make people disappear without trace. So that was the way that the Egyptian state operated. And in January and February, millions of Egyptians said, of course, that they had had enough. And there was a phenomenal mass uprising, not just against the regime of Mubarak, but everything he stood for. Most importantly, the very agenda of neoliberalism, the very agenda of making the mass of people pay for the conduct of corporate capital, of the bankers and speculators, that very agenda was met head on by the mass of people in Egypt. There were huge events in the major cities, but during those events, something of extraordinary importance happened, and that was the emergence onto the scene of the mass of Egyptian workers who came from their factories and from the docks and from the railways and from the buses into mass strike action to support the people of the streets. It was at that moment that the Egyptian generals knew that their time, or that Mubarak's time was up. And that was the moment when the Mubarak regime fell. Now I just want to make a few more comments before hopefully we will be able to discuss some of the issues which arise from these extraordinary developments. What the Egyptian revolution has been saying, and I want to steal a phrase from uh, Barack Obama, what the Egyptian revolution was saying was that after 30 years of repression, yes we can and we will, and they did. And you remember the slogan in Arabic of the revolution, Irhal, go. And by force of collective will of the people in the streets and in the workplaces, Mubarak did go. But during the course of the months, what Egyptians have discovered is that just getting rid of the personal dictator isn't anything like enough. It's the dictatorship itself and the system it supports that is the problem. And the revolution has been ongoing, broadening and deepening because people have begun to realise that their newfound freedoms give them the opportunity to do the things they need to do to feed their children, secure their jobs if they're peasants, to retrieve the land and they have discovered all sorts <coughs> of new forms of collective organisation. Independent trade unions have sprouted in every area of the country. Two weeks ago I was in Cairo on a demonstration of the nation's teachers. Teachers are people so poorly paid in Egypt that they and their families live at the margin of society. Believe me, they could hardly afford to pay the rent and put food on the table. 50,000 teachers came to central Cairo and they demonstrated for the doubling of their pitiful wages for independent trade union rights. And their slogans borrowed from the slogans of Tahrir in January and February. Their slogan was the teachers demand the fall of the minister. Echoing the slogan of Tahrir, the people demand the fall of the regime. Their other slogan was Irhal, go. This directed at the Minister of Education who made and broken so many promises. And this was an inspiring demonstration. Tahrir was made by the youth. There's no question that the young people of Egypt led the events in the new year. But the teachers of Tahrir two weeks ago were people of my age. 
the average age was into the 40s or even 50s. <coughs> and it demonstrated how far the revolutionary movement has reached deeply into the society. These events, <coughs> excuse me, these events are ongoing. The revolution continues and of course now the revolution is confronted by an enormous problem. And this is really the issue I want to conclude on. The military are in power in Egypt, the generals, known as the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. They say that there's going to be an election, and when the election has taken place, the revolution will be over. That what people have been fighting for was the right to vote. Tens of millions of Egyptians have discovered something else. That actually, creating the space to hold an election is only the beginning. Because actually, creating political parties, if they're able to, creating a bit of space to organise in the streets like this, is a huge advance. But it only opens up the bigger agenda of change. Because an election in Egypt is only going to, in a sense, bring to power people who want to replicate the problem. Who's going to pay the minimum wage so that people can put food on the table? Who's going to create the jobs? Who's going to guarantee that the peasants who have been forced off the land in their millions can get back to the land? Who's going to deal with the problem of the bankers and speculators, many of them based not more than half a mile from this very spot? Because the fate of people in places like Egypt and all around the world is very often shaped by the speculators of New York, Tokyo and especially the city of London. Who's going to crack those problems? So there's an enormous impetus in Egypt for the revolution to go forward, for people to extend their rights and to demand further change. And my very last observation is this. If you follow <coughs> the news from this part of the world, and I think it's very well worth doing, you'll learn about this widening and deepening of the revolution. People haven't gone away from Tahrir. They're there almost every Friday. They're mobilised in their workplaces. They're engaging in ever broader and wider strike activity. And they see that these initiatives find an echo elsewhere. When I see that the Occupy movement in the US, starting of course in Wall Street, has spread across the country so that cities as distant as Seattle and Chicago and Tucson, Arizona, in the deepest part of the deep south, identify with the movement of Tahrir and say that if the Egyptians can do it, we can do it. And when I read the following headline from a newspaper, in Occupy London protest, Echoes of Cairo, or when I read this, a street sign that renamed the area, this area, outside St Paul's, Tahrir Square was erected early on in the day when the protest began here and a banner declared the IMF is our global Mubarak. When I read this in an Egyptian newspaper, Al Masri Al Yom, you can see what the academics sometimes call the feedback effect. The way in which under the circumstances today of a global environment where we can communicate one with another, learn from one with another, show solidarity one with another, in the most positive sense, learn and imitate one another, you can see how the connection between Tahrir, Chicago, Seattle, other great cities, the great movement we've seen in Spain over recent months, and here too in London, can forge a common cause. Thanks for listening to me. Engineered or allowed by the Western nations, the imperialist nations, as part of whatever economic uh, aim that they have. I, 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 that, I mean, I've, I've demonstrated in Cairo as well, and that seems like an extremely painful and upsetting thing for me to hear. And I just wondered what you thought were any truths around that. Thank you. Hello, yeah. That's a very good question. I hope everyone picked that up. In, 
to do with the fact the Western governments allow in some way these events in Cairo to take place? And I would respond to that by saying, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And the events in Egypt have sent a shiver of horror down the spines of the people who enjoy authority and power in countries like this one. Why? Because although uh, Cameron or Obama want to try and identify with the spirit of a victorious movement, look, Hillary Clinton was in Cairo in March, and the first thing she did when she arrived at Cairo Airport was made sure was to make sure she went down to Dakhria and was photographed by the world media walking around and shaking people's hands. And Obama says, if only the youth of America were like the youth of Egypt. <laughs> so now, yes, now they want, now they want some of the incense glitter of the mass movement to be associated with themselves. But the Mubarak regime was supported for years by the Americans. Only Israel has received more aid over the last 30 years from the United States. More. Only Israel received more than Egypt. And as I said earlier, Egypt was part of a military alliance with the Americans, which included the provision to take prisoners for torture and abuse in Egyptian prisons. More than that, many European and American investors have ploughed their money into Egypt. Into what? Mainly into speculative property development and into the commercialization of the agricultural sector. So the British, the American and the other governments were hand in glove with Mubarak. And one of, uh, so when they look at events like this event, they can make the connection. The question, of, uh, uh, I mean I've said rather a lot already so I'll keep this terse. So I want to make just one more point about this. It's a very important issue. For years, politicians and strategists in Europe and North America and the world media have scoffed at the apparent passivity of what's called in the Middle East the Arab street. In other words, popular politics in the Arab world. The time of the Gaza invasion by the Israelis, for example, they said, what's the Arab street going to do? What are the Egyptians doing? Ah, the Israelis got away with it. We don't need to be so worried about these popular opinion in the Arab world. They're not saying that now. One of the most important pillars of imperialist policy, and I use the term, let me repeat that, imperialist policy in the Middle East was the re Mubarak regime, and the Americans and the British and others are doing their best to ensure that the military stay in power in Egypt. In my opinion, my opinion, the mass of people in Egypt are going to make that very, very difficult. Very difficult. We need to be watching those events closely, identifying ourselves, I suggest, with the movement of that mass of people. And I can assure you that David Cameron, Obama and the rest of them will not be wanting to see their friends, the generals, out of power. They'll be hoping very much to discover a new Mubarak with whom they can strike terms. About the brutal killing of all those Christians, oh, who yes. is involved with that? State. Terrible. You tell me. Absolutely horrific. The brutal killing of the of the Christian, the Coptic Christians, the Sunday before last. Uh, again, another, another very important point. Who killed those people? Well, I'm in constant constant contact with people in Cairo, and I had many friends on that demonstration, Muslims and Christians, and. Each one of them testifies that the killing of the, I think, 25 people who were murdered was a killing perpetrated by the military police who, as you've seen maybe on some of the coverage, drove their armoured personnel carriers over the demonstrators and shot them from behind police lines. This was a naked attempt to sow sectarian conflict, to deepen suspicion between Muslims and Christians. And the following, the following day, and the following Friday, the day of prayer for Muslims, there was a large demonstration of Muslims and Christians from Al-Azhar, the main mosque 
in solidarity with the Coptic victims which marched to the Christian cathedral and their slogan was Muslims and Christians are one hand. It's the military that's the problem, not the sectarian conflict of ordinary Egyptians. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a point that, thank you very much, it's, uh, it's definitely, it's concerning for me that the media has uh, pretty much since the revolution, awesome, since the revolution um, said, well done, Mubarak has fallen and everything's okay now, the mainstream media is pretty much, that's their take on it, and as you were saying, it's going to be a lot harder and I'm quite concerned about the election because the only party that really has enough money and um, uh, organisation are the Muslim Brotherhood, <laughs> really, are the only opposition at the moment. So what, what do you say because all the other movements aren't organised enough or have anywhere near enough yeah. money at the moment to provide an opposition? Another very, very important question about the Muslim Brotherhood. I must say, I think it's amazing to have a, a meeting in the evening in central London like this, discussing the complexities um, and possible outcomes of the Egyptian revolution. It's absolutely marvellous, and it shows, you know, it, it shows the sort of initiative which events like this uh, can take. But, okay, this important question. We have a big problem in Europe and North America in the dominant media about Islamophobia. We have a very serious problem. And one aspect of this is that when there are big changes in the Middle East, in countries with predominantly Muslim populations, journalists and academics like to say it can only go one way, backwards, towards something regressive. Because whenever there are large numbers of Muslims involved in political activity, the argument comes, Islam is a backward culture, Islam is a troublesome and violent culture, and people who, who are active self-consciously as Muslims is all, is all going to come to a bad end. In the middle of this summer there was a big demonstration of the Islamist movement in Egypt, and the Western media could hardly wait to say, we told you so, here comes the Muslim Brotherhood, it's all going wrong. Now, although myself, I'm personally not an Islamist, I come from the other end of the political spectrum on the left, it's quite clear to me that Islam and the Muslim Brotherhood are not the problem in Egypt. As a matter of fact, the Muslim Brotherhood is in a lot of trouble in the election. And very briefly, I want to explain why. Big Islamic organizations combine together people of all sorts of different statuses and positions and classes. When you don't have much of an option for political activity in countries which repress the whole of the opposition, it's very easy to attach yourself to anything that moves, that seems to sometimes to pose a radical alternative. And that's why the Muslim Brotherhood has grown in Egypt, and why organisations in other parts of the Islamic world have grown under similar circumstances. But when you have a big popular movement, like a revolution, in which the collective of people begins to bring results, organisations like the Muslim Brotherhood start to become very unstable. And what's happening in Egypt at this moment, if you care to read the press, or look at the websites, is that the Muslim Brotherhood is uh, becoming a very volatile organisation in which large numbers of people are leaving and moving into much more activist forms of politics. To answer your important question, the Muslim Brotherhood will collect quite a number of votes in the Egyptian uh, election, but it will not emerge as a party which can shape the politics of the country. The politics of Egypt is being shaped by ordinary people 
in the streets is being shaped by the new independent trade union movement. It's shaped, being shaped by the new peasant cooperatives that are coming into being. In short, it's being shaped by ordinary people. And that's, I think, where we should focus our attention and be very sceptical when we're told that big movements like this are always going to go in a negative direction and the countries in which large numbers of Muslims are engaged in political activity are countries fated to return, regress some way to a lesser form of political organisation. So if you, want, if you keep an eye on the elections, I don't believe it'll be anything like as negative as the journalists are predicting. I'm just really in support of Rea. It's really difficult to have a logical conversation with someone that is so completely obsessed with any religion, so completely obsessed. Bear in mind, a religion of a faith, yeah, absolutely means you surrender your, 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 your God, but not everyone else's God. Don't put your faith down people's faith. But actually, believe in a God to that degree, I think it's quite delusional, and it removes people from accountability for their own thoughts and their own actions. It makes you illogical. Please, please, please. Yeah. This is about logic. This is about sense. We have brains ourselves, and we are accountable for our actions. Do not surrender yourself. But I think it might be too late. Let's not make this into another discussion. We're talking about Egypt and the global resistance. Let's stick with this one for now. <laughs> I'm going well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Can we let? Uh, uh, yeah, um, thanks everyone. Um, uh, I was lucky enough uh, on International Labour Day on, on, my, uh, on, on my London Underground work and I was uh, invited with some of my comrades from the RMT to go and visit some of these independent trade unions that are now set up uh, in the Egyptian Revolution. Um, it was a genuinely awe-inspiring, uh, humbling event. I've never been, uh, I've never met, been to a place anywhere so liberated in my life as Cairo was at that time. And uh, having considered myself a revolutionary for much of my adult life, I suddenly realised I've never really believed that that was how amazing it was going to feel, and, and that people would walk the streets feeling, t uh, fe feeling so cool and feeling so in control of their own lives. Um, but so, but so, I think an important lesson that I took away from it, and I, I think something that you know, re really sh um, should be of use to you here is that what, uh, what, the, uh, what the workers in the independent unions told me was that the, uh, the mass process, the mass process of the young, the dispossessed in Tahrir Square gave them the confidence to realise the time had come to, uh, to take action. And uh, there, was uh, there was a group of workers who had uh, taken completely illegal, almost semi-clandestine actions against the government in the past. Uh, who uh, went to Tahrir Square and uh, they'd, uh, they'd led a massive struggle a couple of years earlier, very bravely in the face of violent repression, and they put out a call for the other workers in other workplaces to start to organise and, and to fight back against, um, against Mubarak. And uh, since then there's been a flowering of independent trade unionism. Obviously I myself as a transport worker, I was very pleased to meet the transport workers out there, I was very pleased to meet factory workers, I was very pl pleased to meet all those people. But the actual union that kicked it off it wasn't any of those. It was public sector workers, it was the tax collectors who had had a massive battle in 2007 against the state, against the terrible conditions they were labouring under. Really exploited people, servants, supposedly public servants, being very badly treated by the state. And they fought back and they turned up to Tahrir Square where the protesters were and they said, you've got to take this movement into your workplaces. Why, am I, why do I think that this is a point that, uh, that is very important to you? Because you've got the opportunity to deliver the same thing here. Public sector workers in this country are being very badly treated by a Tory government that hates the public sector. They hate the schools that educate you and your children. They hate the hospitals that look after you and you're vulnerable. They hate the job centres. They, they hate all the, sort of the social security that, that acts as a safety net to stop people like yourselves, people you care about, from descending into poverty. And that's why they're having to strike, because their pension's getting taken away, which is part of a plot against the, against the public sector that the majority of us, the 99%, all need. Now, you don't, you don't need to ask where those people are. You see them every day. Every day you see a hospital. Every day you see a school. Every day you see a job centre. Every day you are seeing people. Where they, uh, you, you are seeing places where these people who are going into struggle, these working people who are risking a lot to go into struggle to try and protect them, try and protect their very modest livelihoods. And, you, uh, and 
if there's, if there's one thing I think you can do to help build this movement is to go to those places and to, uh, to speak to those people and ask them what you can do to help them fight their fight with <coughs> What do you can do to help them fight their fight, to win strike balance, to organise successful action, and to unite against the uh, uh, against the common enemy, a, 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 a government of a super wealthy that doesn't care about ordinary people? Thank you. to have a logical conversation with someone that is so completely obsessed with any religion, so completely obsessed. Bear in mind, a religion or a faith, yeah, absolutely means you surrender your, 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 yeah, your, your God, but not everyone else's God. Don't put your faith down people's side. But actually to believe in a God to that degree, I think it's quite delusional, and it removes people from accountability for their own thoughts and their own actions. It makes you illogical. Please. Please, please, yeah, this is about logic, this is about sense, we have brains ourselves and we are accountable for our actions, do not surrender yourself, but I think it might be too late. Let's not make this into another discussion, we're talking about Egypt and the global resistance, let's stick with this one for now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Um, yeah, um, thanks everyone. Um, uh, I was lucky enough uh, on International Labour Day on, on, my, uh, on, on my London Underground work and I was uh, invited with some of my comrades from the RMT to go and visit some of these independent trade unions that are now set up uh, in the Egyptian Revolution. Um, it was a genuinely awe-inspiring, uh, humbling event. I've never been, uh, I've never met, been to a place anywhere so liberated in my life as Cairo was at that time. And, uh, having considered myself a revolutionary for much of my adult life, I suddenly realised I've never really believed that that was how amazing it was going to feel and, and that people would walk the streets feeling, t uh, feeling so tall and feeling so in control of their own lives. Um, but so, but so, uh, I think an important lesson that I took away from it, and I, I think something that you know, re really sh um, should be of use to you here, is that what, uh, what, the, uh, what the workers in the independent unions told me was that the, uh, the mass process, the mass process of the young, the dispossessed in Tahrir Square gave them the confidence to realise the time had come to, uh, to take action. And uh, there, was uh, there was a group of workers who had uh, taken completely illegal, almost semi-clandestine actions against the government in the past, uh, who uh, went to Tahrir Square and uh, they'd, uh, they'd led a massive struggle a couple of years earlier, very bravely in the face of violent repression. And they put out a call for the other workers in other workplaces to start to organise. And to, and to fight back against, um, against Mubarak. And uh, since then, there's been a flowering of independent trade unionism. Obviously, I myself as a transport worker, I was very pleased to meet the transport workers out there. I was very pleased to meet factory workers. I was very pl pleased to meet all those people. But the actual union that kicked it off wasn't any of those. It was public sector workers. It was the tax collectors who had had a massive battle in 2007 against the state, against the terrible conditions they were labouring under. Really exploited people, servants, supposedly public servants, being very badly treated by the state, and they fought back, and they turned up to Tahrir Square, where the protesters were, and they said, you've got to take this movement into your workplaces. Why am I, why do I think that this is a point that, uh, that is very important to you? Because you've got the opportunity to deliver the same thing here. Public sector workers in this country are being very badly treated by a Tory government that hates the public sector. They hate the schools that educate you and your children. They hate the hospitals that look after you and you're vulnerable. They hate the job centres. They, they hate all the, so the social security that acts as a safety net to stop people like yourselves, people you care about, from descending into poverty. And that's why they're having to strike, because their pension's getting taken away, which is part of a plot against the, against the public sector that the majority of us, the 99%, all need. Now, you don't, you don't need to ask where those people are. You see them every day. Every day you see a hospital, every day you see a school, every day you see a job centre, every day you're seeing people, where they, uh, you, you are seeing places where these people who are going into struggle, these working people who are risking a lot to go into struggle to try and protect them, try and protect their very modest livelihoods. And, you, uh, and if, there's, if there's one thing I think you can do to help build this movement is to go to those places and to, uh, to speak to those people and ask them what you can do to help them fight their fight with... <coughs> 
what you can do to help them fight their fight, to win strike balance, to organise successful action, and to unite against the uh, uh, against the common enemy, a, 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 a government of a super wealthy that doesn't care about ordinary people. Thank you. Testing, testing. You hear that? Uh, I just wanted to add a little thing, which is while uh, you were giving your very good talk, which I enjoyed very much, um, uh, a chap to my left peered in and tapped me on the shoulder. He was wearing a, a suit and he uh, looked about 60, a very well-dressed man, uh, and had a briefcase in his right arm. And he leant into my ear and said, uh, I've worked in the high end of the financial industry for 35 years, and believe me, uh, we, uh, people like me, desperately need more people like you, which by that he meant all of you as well. So I thought I'd just bring that to the table. Thank you. Like to, uh... This is a question again rather than a statement. Um, I mentioned before that I demonstrated in Cairo. The reason I was over there was because I was part of the Gaza Freedom March um, in 2009 stroke 10, uh, the majority of which was trapped in Cairo and there was enormous riots in Cairo if anybody's familiar with that story. Uh, and a small group of those people actually made it up to Rafa and I was lucky enough to make it all the way uh, north up to the Rafa border and there were some demonstrations there, etc. Um, so my question is about uh, Gaza and how you feel that the changes in Egypt might go on to impact Gaza. Thanks. Another, another really, really important question. What's the relationship between the so-called Arab Spring and the Palestinian question? Very important. And uh, I want to make a suggestion that the events in Egypt would actually never have happened without the struggle of the Palestinians. Yeah. Now this might sound a bit back to front, but I want to explain what I mean. In the year 2000, the second great Palestinian intifada started, the uprising started. And one of the most significant developments which followed it was the emergence of a mass movement of solidarity amongst Egyptians with the intifada. Now, this was not widely publicized in the world press, but all over Egypt, millions of people undertook their own forms of solidarity. Some attempted to go to, uh, to Gaza with aid and support. Some participated in demonstrations, marches and rallies. The most prominent amongst them were young people, especially young women in schools and colleges. And I had many Egyptian friends who testified to battles which took place between the riot police and the youth in cities and towns all over Egypt. With the demonstrators raising the Palestinian flag and the Palestinian scarf for Kofiya in solidarity with the Palestinians. Now the important thing about that, about that movement was that it created some political space for protest amongst Egyptians. Egyptians drew strength from the fact that for the first time in almost 20 years, they'd been able to organize those demonstration rallies despite the police and the presence of the riot forces. And Egyptians went on from the Palestinian Solidarity Movement to organize an anti-war movement at the time that Tony Blair and George Bush were planning and then executing the invasion of Iraq, there was a huge movement of protest in Cairo. On a magical day, in March 2003, 50,000 people took over Tahrir Square. They called it the Tahrir Intifada, and it was like a rehearsal for what took place earlier this year. And then that movement, stimulated a further movement, the democracy movement in Egypt, with people protesting about corruption and demanding uh, the right to assembly and to form free political parties. So one movement gave rise to the confidence to develop others. Now I don't think the, the revolution of this year can be explained 
without these years of struggle, within which the Palestinian struggle has always been extremely important. So the Palestinians in many ways inspired Egyptians a decade ago to start taking the initiative. And I think it's right to say now that the movement of Tahrir is inspiring the Palestinians too. There was a remarkable day in March, in May this year, when Palestinians marched on their own border, the border of Israel. And the events of the last two or three days, in which of course the Israelis and the Hamas have exchanged prisoners, everyone familiar with this news, these are developments which would not have taken place without the Arab Spring. And the radicalization of the Palestinian movement which is underway, another aspect of the general movement for change which is underway across the Arab world and North Africa. So I think there's an intimate link between the Arab Spring and the Palestinian question. Um, probably like many people here, I have the aspiration for a free Palestine. The Palestinians for years have faced the enormous problem of being a fragmented and divided society, a scattered diaspora across the Arab states. Something of enormous importance has happened, and that is people with the power to bring change through collective struggle in the country next door. Palestine and Egypt are not a million miles apart, they are neighboring societies. And in Egypt, the regime of Mubarak, who himself policed the border of Gaza, who closed the border of Gaza, imprisoning the Palestinians in the south while the Israelis imprisoned them in the north, that regime has now gone. So we can see the inspiration for further change. The Palestinian struggle is embedded in the struggle for change in the Arab world, and I think we're going to see further episodes, further struggles, which hopefully will bring us towards some sort of satisfactory conclusion for the Palestinian people. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, no better. Okay, thank, thanks for your talk and uh, your responses to a lot of the questions, Bill. It's been uh, really interesting. I just wanted to echo really something that was said by our uh, friend over there from the RMT, but just try and get a bit more detail about the role of the trade unions in, in the Egyptian revolution. Um, because, of course, it was central. I mean, the, the scenes of up to a million people packed into Tahrir Square on successive days um, in the build-up to, to Mubarak's fall was what caught the media's attention, what caught the attention of the whole world, because it was incredible and it was inspiring. But also we saw a constant wave of strikes in uh, Mahalla, Kubra, in uh, Aswan, in Suez, um, and in Cairo itself, and across the country. And it was absolutely key to what happened and to, to breaking uh, um, Mubarak's resistance to what was a burgeoning movement. What does that tell us about what can happen in this country? What does that tell us about what can happen across Europe in terms of uniting these kinds of occupations and the kinds of explosions of anger that we've seen on the streets uh, uh, across Europe and the role of trade unions and the role of, of mass strikes and what is, the, what is the key to understanding the role that they can play and the role that they played in Egypt in bringing down Bulbaric. So just a bit more on that front. Okay, um, I suggested earlier on that Mubarak himself would not have fallen, or certainly not with the speed with which he eventually fell, without the intervention on the political scene of the Egyptian workers, who have a very, very long tradition of struggle going back many generations, but who for the last 30 years have been ruthlessly suppressed by the Mubarak police state. Well, in early February this year, while the young people were in possession of Tahrir and fighting against the offensive of the state, millions of Egyptians in their workplaces joined the struggle by engaging in mass industrial action, the focus of which was solidarity with Tahrir and the demand Irhal. He must go. 
So the people of the workplaces joined the people of the streets. But when some of the streets around Tahrir had emptied, as the months passed, the struggle in the workplaces continued. People engaged in the process of what's being called in Egypt the cleansing, the removal from the workplaces and businesses of industry and industries of the cronies and piles of Mubarak, the people up to their ears in corruption, who had really been stealing from the enterprises in which they were in authority. And people said, we demand the right to live. We demand the right to have jobs and the right to live and the right to shape the destiny of the workplaces and industries in which we work. And so a process of what is sometimes called continuing or permanent revolution got underway, whereby people's struggles for wages and industrial rights turned into something intensely political. The notion that we could only bring a wider benefit, a wider collective benefit in the society by using our power in the workplaces to continue change. And this is the moment we're now at in the Egyptian revolution. There's been a whole host of independent trade unions established in workplaces and across industries. Hardly a day passes without a new group of workers, men and women, formulating demands, just demands about their pay or their pensions or their conditions or getting rid of oppressive and bullying bosses. And it's this momentum which is the military in power is having such difficulty controlling. And because I think we've got to bring our meeting to an end in a moment, I just want to add one point to this. There have been a number of references to events in Britain and industrial events here. And I want to encourage everybody, whether or not you have a job at the moment, but of course increasing numbers of us don't, whether or not you're in an organised trade union or workplace, to join the big day of action in Britain which is coming up at the end of November, on November the 30th, when we in our millions from the education sector and the health sector, from every area of society where the government is trying to steal our pensions, the government is trying ruthlessly to drive back the rights and entitlements that we've built up over the years, we'll be having a day of action to defend our rights and entitlements and to say that the neoliberal agenda, the same agenda, that has tempted the Egyptians to stand up for themselves and remove a dictatorship, that very same agenda that we challenge it, because not a day is passing here without more news about mass sackings, mass redundancies, and of course I think everyone involved in the Occupy movement here is well aware that as we struggle for our living, our jobs, to hang on to our pensions, the fat bloody cats from down the road here and in Canary Wharf continue to loot us and stack their back pockets. November the 30th is a big day for us when we can come together and say, no we won't, no we're resisting and we're going to carry that resistance forward by mobilising our strength of collective organisation. Egypt, Cairo, Tahrir Square, St Paul's, it's one struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it's over here, they're over here if you'd like to come and uh, 